Let me begin our time together by telling you about an event that took place when I was in high school. I was living in San Jose, California. That's where I grew up. Anyone from San Jose here? And my, my dad and my brother, who was younger than me, he was in junior high, I was, in, I was a young high schooler, and I decided to go on a hike up by Lexington Reservoir. And we went out, we headed out in the morning, but we got surprised by the weather. In other words, it was, it was about 20 degrees hotter that day than we expected. We were about two hours out on our hike when, um, when we realized that we were probably too far out for the amount of water that we had, we were running out of water. So we turned around and we started heading back. And during that period of time, the, the, the temperature just soared really quickly, and I was never so thirsty as I felt at that moment in my life. We worked our way back. I remember walking past this one like, pipe that was coming out of the reservoir, and it just you know, had terrible water in it. I, I thought about drinking it. I thought, no, we're not going to do that. We went by the reservoir. You can't drink out of that reservoir. We got back to the car. There's no water in the car. We had to drive all the way down into San Jose, probably a three-hour period without any water, and a super hot day, and I've never been so thirsty in my life. And I'd like to use that as a metaphor today for what I think is actually going on right now. There is a longing for the work of the Holy Spirit in this day and age. Now, I don't mean a work of the Holy Spirit where we're doing some type of thing that is like out there, kind of crazy, wild. I mean, many of us grow up in church backgrounds that you would have to describe as allergic to the Holy Spirit. I know that I did. And we need to learn more about the Holy Spirit. Some of us grow up in church backgrounds which emphasize just one aspect of the Holy Spirit, his power. And we actually need a recorrection as well. We need to focus on what is Paul's center of the teaching of the Holy Spirit. His center is not the spiritual gifts or the so-called spiritual gifts. It is the Holy Spirit in salvation and the Holy Spirit in sanctification, especially that growing us in holiness. Probably the best passage in the Bible to go to if you want to, to, want to read about the Holy Spirit's work in, in sanctification is Romans 8. And we were just reading out of Romans 8. We didn't even finish the whole book. I don't know if you know, there was a pastor's conference a few years ago, and they asked these pastors, if you were, to, if you were stranded on a deserted island, and you can only have one passage in the Bible, one chapter out of the Bible, which would it be? And Romans 8 won out because it's so rich and so deep and so full. But let me tell you, we're not going to unpack the whole thing. We couldn't possibly in the period of time. It's just such a rich passage. But I would like to focus in on the seven main things that this passage teaches us about walking in the Holy Spirit. How do you walk in the Holy Spirit? What are the steps that you take actually to live out your life in and through and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you have a Bible, make sure you look at it. If you've got it on your phone, that would be great as well. But follow along with me as we go through this. We're going to talk about seven main things about living life in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to try to help make sure that you remember these before we're done too. So the first of these is found in verse, verse 4. It just is walk in the Spirit. It says, in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now some of your Bibles, some of your translations will translate the metaphor walk out and just translate that as live. But walk actually is Paul's favorite metaphor for living life, living life as a Christian. He uses it 32 times, and here, the word here is literally walk, peripateo. So you need to walk in the Spirit. Now this is a catch-all for everything else that's gonna be said here. It's a general description for, um, for everything else that's going to fall under this particular heading. But I'll tell you what, walking in the Spirit is key. So the first thing that you need to remember about living out your life in Christ is that you need to walk in the Spirit. Now why did I just do that? Because I want to ask you to do that. Just say, walk in the Spirit, and do this. Walk in the Spirit. Say that. Walk in the Spirit. Do it again. Walk in the Spirit. Okay, now, walking and learning how to walk was really important for me because when I was a young man, I didn't know about walking as a metaphor for the Christian life. I wanted things to happen right then. I wanted to overcome sin 
then I wanted to share the gospel and have people come to Christ, then I wanted to live in holiness, then, but I need to learn how to walk. Do you know why? It's because the Christian life is a long walk in the same direction. It isn't a sprint, and it isn't sitting on a lounge chair on some, like, cruise ship somewhere. It is a, a walk, a solid walk, in one direction by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, you need to learn how to walk in the Spirit. Maybe I can give you um, a little illustration of this. I love to walk. Um, in fact, it's my favorite prayer posture. Some people kneel, some people sit, some people raise their hands, some people stand. I like to walk. The rhythm helps keep me focused, helps keep me moving forward, and I don't tend to get distracted by things that are around me as much as other people do. Some people who get distracted a lot, they need to write their prayers or they need to kneel or whatever they do to, to stay undistracted. But I love to walk. I also love to take walks with my wife. Sometimes we'll take walks in the evening and I love my wife and loving husband that I am. Sometimes I'll put my arm around her and as we're walking along, that works okay except sometimes we're bumping into each other, right? Because we're not in step with each other. If we get in step with each other, then we walk okay. That's the metaphor right there. The Holy Spirit sets the pace and we get in step with him. We need to learn how to walk in the Spirit. So there's not much more to say about this because it's the catch-all expression here. You just need to remember that it's the basic description for living out life in the Holy Spirit. So do you remember it? Walk in the Spirit. Say it. Walk in the Spirit. Now the second thing that you need to remember is to set your mind on the things of the Spirit. So just take your index finger, point to your temple and say, set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Again, set your mind on the things of the Spirit. One more time, set your mind on the things of the Spirit. So this is verses 5 through 7 especially. I'll probably read just beyond that. Verse 5 says, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the, on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. So um, the word here, that says set your mind here. It's not just simply thinking, Greek word, phronema. It's like a mindset. It's having a general orientation. Leon Morris, the commentator on Romans, he calls it thoroughgoing concentration. It makes me think of when I was in high school, when I was in my drama class. We had a, a game that we would play to help us, you know, stay in character. So you would have some monologue you had to memorize. You'd stand up in front of everybody else, and then they would just try to make you laugh. So they would do you know, they make funny faces, and they make sounds that we wouldn't want to repeat in here. And you, the whole time, you, you are focusing. You, you, you take a focus point in the room, and you just stare at that, and you just try not to laugh. And, um, and that focus, that, that set concentration is what we're talking about here. You think about the things of the Spirit. As you go through your day, you keep focusing on the things of the Spirit. Paul talks a lot about thinking, actually. You know, Colossians 3, set your mind on things above, not the things of the earth. Philippians 4, whatever is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, good repute, excellent, worthy of praise. Set your mind on these things. You need to be thinking throughout the day. And it says here that if you do this, then you will not be overcome by the flesh. So what's the flesh? Theological term, Paul's using it here. What is he talking about? He's talking about the pull to sin. The best metaphor I can think of is gravity. It's like everyone has a gravitational pull towards sin. You inherited it from Adam, and because you've sinned so much in your life, you have a tendency to sin. And so you've got this pull that's pulling on you. And actually, you know what? Before you came to know Christ, you were stuck in it. You couldn't overcome it. You would just sin over and over again. You might be able to overcome one habit here, but it will pop up somewhere else in your life. When you came to Christ, the power of sin was broken. You were given the Holy Spirit so that you do not have to sin. The difference between a non-Christian and a Christian, that is someone who's truly a Christian, someone who's actually been born again, is this issue of stuckness. Non-Christians do not have the Holy Spirit. They are stuck in sin. If you want to use the gravity metaphor, they are stuck on the ground. But when you come to Christ, 
you are no longer stuck. By the Spirit, you can overcome sin. It's like getting on a helicopter. Living life according to the Holy Spirit is like getting on a helicopter. It can lift you off of the ground. By the way, gravity is still there. You need to remember it. Don't get out of the helicopter. But you, you by the Spirit, you can actually overcome sin. But the problem is, is we don't spend our days usually thinking about the things of the Spirit, right? We fill our minds with drivel. Dictionary.com uh, defines drivel. Well, there's two meanings of it, right? It's like senseless ideas, and it's literal ideas just like saliva flowing involuntarily out of your mouth. And that's the idea. You've got this, this meaningless kind of stuff that you're running through. It's like, it's like the teenager who is trying to find out you know, what is cool, who they are, how they're supposed to act, how they fit in by looking at YouTube videos or looking at social media rather than actually looking at what the Word of God says and filling your minds with the things of God. Matthew 16, 23, Jesus turns to Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. He uses the same word there as here, phronema. You are not focusing on the things of God's, but the thing of humans. So, how do you live life in the Holy Spirit? You walk in the Spirit. Come on, do it again. Go. Walk in the Spirit. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. And the third thing is you put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. Just do that. Say it. Put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. Again, put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. Verse 13 says this, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now the old word is mortify. So if you had a great grandparent who was talking about this passage, they would be talking about mortify sin. A lot of the, um, the ancient Christian writers used the word mortify. And I don't actually know why we don't use the word anymore. Maybe it just fell out of English. Actually, we do use it occasionally. It's like, oh, I was mortified by what they said or something like that. But that's the only place people ever actually use it. But as an actual serious theological term, I don't hear it much. And I don't know if that's just because English is changing. Maybe it's just that. That happens to language sometimes. Or maybe it's because we don't emphasize this very much. We don't emphasize the idea of actively putting to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. Now, there's a problem, and here's, here's what the problem is. It's that a lot of times um, we have been influenced by kind of this idea that we need to just simply let go and let God do it. We get that from quietism, through the Keswick movement, and um, if you haven't heard of any of that, you probably have heard the slogan, let go, let God. And that's the idea that simply the key to the Christian life is just let go of your own reliance and let God do the work through you. And actually, as far as it goes, that's all good because trust is huge in the Christian life. But at the same time, there's an implicit passivity in that that's problematic. The implicit passivity is the idea that, I don't know, you're just like a limp glove and God puts his hand into you and he does all the work. I actually heard that illustration once when I was a kid. And that's actually not what the Bible says. The Bible says you put to death the deeds of the body. You actively kill it. You mortify it, but it's not in your own power. It's not by your own striving. You do it in concert with the Holy Spirit. You put it to death. Now, you don't put it to death just once. You put it to death again and again. It's like the weeds that grow in my, my lawn. And I go out there with, what, Roundup or some other weed killer, and I... And it's supposed to kill it to the root, like the advertisement says, right? And it does. Sometimes it kills it, but other weeds come up, and I need to kill those. So you keep killing it by the Spirit. We sometimes, we, we have trouble juxtaposing these. We, we put a wedge between these, old, these two ideas. It's like, well, if you, you know, if you're trying hard at something, well, you're not trusting in God, but actually, Paul says, we do this striving according to his power that mightily works within us. He brings the two of them together. You can deeply be trusting in God and actively saying no to sin. So you do this. You not only walk in the Spirit, you not only set your mind on the things of the Spirit, but you put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. Let's see if you remember them. Go. Walk in the Spirit. 
Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. Try it again. Walk in the Spirit. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. And the fourth one, it's like you're holding on to a rope here. Be led by the Spirit. Someone back here knows it. Be led by the Spirit. Okay, this is verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Now, leading of the Spirit, great topic, right? Probably in this passage, it means a little bit more than just what you think of initially when you think of the leading of the Spirit. It probably even includes such things as putting to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. It's a little bit broader. But it doesn't mean less. And there are people today who deny that the Holy Spirit actually leads us and guides us in our daily life and points us into the things that we ought to do. The problem with that, to be quite honest, is just there's three more times that are gonna happen in the immediate context where you actually have the Holy Spirit doing something directly on our spirits. He testifies to our spirit that we're children of God. He helps us in our prayers. We're gonna get to that in just a minute. And he says in in Romans 9, 1, my conscience testifies to me, testifies with my spirit, with the Holy Spirit in my conscience. Anyway, I quoted it wrong, but you got the idea. Um, He also says that there. So we've got the work of the Holy Spirit already pointing towards some sort of more specific guidance. But before I actually give you an illustration of that, let me just say, it's not like a mystical experience where you're just like God just works with someone who is not necessarily living life the way that they they ought to be living under the control of the Holy Spirit. People who don't know the scriptures who just want to have just some sort of special direction for a decision they have to make. You fill yourself with scripture. You think the thoughts of God after him. Your whole direction is focused on Jesus. Your whole life is about him. And you start to think things that are more like the work of the Spirit. And generally, leading of the Spirit is moving in the direction of scripture. Having said that, sometimes God leads us more directly. I think of a time a number of years ago, quite a, quite a while ago, I was walking um, on campus over by the fountain, and there was a student who was in one of my classes. His back was to me. He was over kind of near the Jesus mural over there, and he didn't see me as I walked by, but as I walked by, I just prayed for him by name, asked the Lord to bless him, asked the Lord to strengthen him, and then I kept walking, heading toward Eagle's Nest, but I was, I was about 20, 30 steps along, and I felt very strongly like I needed to turn around and go back. So I did. Turned around, headed back. He was still pointing the other direction, so I tapped him on the shoulder. He turns around, and he says, hey, how are you doing? He just looks at me and goes, I can't believe you're here. Just in this moment, I was praying that God would make a way for me to talk to you. I need to talk to you about something that's very important. So we sat down and we talked right in that moment. I think that the Lord led me in that moment. I've actually had moments when I've woken woken up in the middle of the night and God has given me something where I needed to go and speak with someone and it's been confirmed later on that that was actually of the Holy Spirit. So the Lord does guide us by his spirit sometimes. We still need to be ready to make decisions by wisdom that are saturated in the Bible, but we need to be led by the spirit. By the way, I lived in the Middle East for um, seven years and one of the keys, uh, the key things that we would try to do, my wife and I, as we lived in the Middle East, is we would just pray, Lord, guide us to the people who are open, the people that you're already drawing to yourself. So we had to learn more about this, walking in the Spirit and being led by the Spirit. All right, those are four things. Let's do them. We're going to go to seven, so you've got to remember these as we go. Ready? Go. Walk in the Spirit. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Do it again. Walk in the Spirit. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. And now the longest one. Listen carefully. Just just take your hand and put it over your fist like that. Like a big bear hug or something and say, Know the fatherhood of God by the Spirit. Say that. Know the fatherhood of God by the Spirit. Again, know the fatherhood of God by the Spirit. One more time. Know the fatherhood of God by the Spirit. Okay, and this is especially in verses 15 through 17. It says this, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, 
but you've received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. This uh, teaching about the fatherhood of God is so rich. We ought to just be doing a whole message just on this. But let me just give you the basic idea. The basic idea is that you have a slave who is adopted by his master. And since he's so used to being a slave, he cringes when his master calls him. But the Holy Spirit, it's as though the Holy Spirit is next to him, standing next to him and saying, you've been called by your father. Go to him. It's like the Holy Spirit is helping you. You don't have to cringe. You don't have to be afraid. There's no reason to be afraid. Go to him. That's the Holy Spirit's work. It's just absolutely amazing. And by the way, Abba here, this idea of Abba Father, it doesn't simply mean Daddy. I know you've heard that a lot of times probably. It probably is very intimate, but it also includes respect. So it's respect and intimacy wrapped up all together here. Um, I just wanted to point that out. But I'll tell you what, if you know that God is your Father, it can make such a difference. I had a student in New York. I used to teach at Nyack College there. And, um, and he was from a family, a very difficult family, uh, alcoholic father, and um, had a huge, huge amount of trouble relating to God as father. But we continued to talk and pray together and look at the scriptures, and eventually he came into a place of uh, understanding his adoption as a child of God. Interestingly enough, I was, um, I was, talk I was Skyping with him. He's a missionary now in Tanzania, and, um, and it was so great. We're Skyping. He's sitting in a jungle. Isn't technology amazing? We're actually, we're actually Skyping there, and he's just this confident person living life now in the Holy Spirit, knowing the fatherhood of God. And you can just, uh, just knowing the truths that are here can so help you to move into a deeper understanding of who God is as your father. So that's one of the main ideas here. There's actually a number of ideas in this section. One of them is that it just says the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. It's one of the ways that you know that you're a child of God. A lot of places in the Bible it talks about fruit in your life. Are you living out actually what you claim to say? That's one of the ways you can know that you know him. But here it just says that there's some work of the Holy Spirit, something mystical, something different, that he actually testifies to our spirit, helps us to know that we are children of God. By the way, that truth was, was really important to me a number of years ago when my mom, um, when she was in the throes of Alzheimer's disease, my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. She had what's called early onset Alzheimer's disease. And it was really hard for me to see my mom, who I loved deeply and had a real spiritual impact on my life, to see her degenerating in her thinking and her thoughts are just terribly confused. She didn't always know who we were or you know, what was going on. Um, and I didn't always know how to pray for, pray for her. And I remember one morning I was on my porch and I was reading through Romans 8 and I came to this verse and I thought, I can pray that for her, right? I can pray this for her. Lord, I pray that in my mom's spirit you will remind her that she is a child of God, even if her brain is confused, that the wires are confused. I pray that you will minister to her and let her know that she is your child today. And the Lord ministered to me as I was able to pray for my mom that way. And I'm sure that the Lord answered my prayer too. Now you realize that the fatherhood of God here, it's through adoption. God chooses you um, about uh, seven years ago, um, we, we added to our family two beautiful young girls, 11 and 9, were adopted into our family. Now they're young women. Dearly love these girls. So I have four daughters, and um, two of them are adopted. And I learned through that process about the love of God for me in a way that I never did before. Just, just by loving on these girls and um, having a relationship with them, I learned what God does with us day in and day out. Sometimes we receive it, sometimes we don't receive it. And uh, I was moved to learn more about God as our adoptive father. So if you've ever had trouble relating to, um, to your own earthly father, remember God has adopted you. Actually, in this passage, he not only adopts you now, there's like even like a second adoption party that happens in the future. And we're gonna get to that right now. So we've got to remember the five that we've got before we can get to number six. Ready? Go. 
Walk in the Spirit. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Know the fatherhood of God by the Spirit. Some of you are struggling with this. Let's do it again. Go. Walk in the Spirit. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Know the fatherhood of God by the Spirit. And the next one, you just bring your arms in and just go, hope in the Spirit. Say that. Hope in the Spirit. Again, hope in the Spirit. And why am I doing it like this? The reason I'm doing it like this is because it's not just generally hope. It's like hope in the midst of a fallen and a broken world that is groaning for our redemption. It's like in the middle of this difficult world, we still hope. Have you realized that in English, the word hope is a super weak word? Well, when you come to my party, I hope so. Yeah. Um, I hope things will get better, you know, when I go to college. We use it really loosely. It is not in this passage. The word el pis in, um, in Greek it means to have eager expectation, to eagerly anticipate something. And what this is talking about, it's talking about our future adoption as children. Here's the verses right here. Actually, it's a long section, so I'll only read just a few verses of it. It's in verses, I'll, st- I'll pick it up from verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Every time I read that verse, I think of, well, I have four daughters, I can say this, right? I think of the, the movie Beauty and the Beast, where there's like a wardrobe and a candlestick and whatever else who are under a curse and just groaning until the curse is broken, right? And they can be free. It's like the whole world, the, the mountains and the, the trees and the rocks and all of them, they're waiting for us, for our final redemption. They're groaning together. And that's what I get when I read that. But it's not just them. Look at verse 23. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoptions as sons, the redemption of our body, for in hope we have been saved, it says right there. So we're longing we're groaning along with all of creation. Now this, this, this verse is actually pretty surprising, I'll be on, honest. Here's what you expect to have it say. You're expecting that you're going to be reading along. It's like, the whole world is groaning and struggling. It's really hard. And then the Holy Spirit comes into us and he comforts us. That is not what this passage says. Theologically, it's correct. Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit as the comforter. All that's good. That's all fine and well. The Holy Spirit does comfort us. But that's not this passage. This passage says that the presence of the Spirit makes us groan more. It's like you're longing for the future redemption, which is one of the things we're supposed to do because the Holy Spirit lives within us and it shows the disparity between the fallen world that we live in and the glorious future that's going to happen when Jesus returns, raises our bodies, sets up his new kingdom, and creates the new heavens and the new earth for us. That's going to be a great and glorious day. I remember when I was living in Portland, Oregon, my parents surprised me my first semester away from home. I was living 700 miles away from home as a college student, and they surprised me and sent me a plane ticket to come home for Thanksgiving, which was a really sweet surprise because I really missed my family. So I took that plane ticket and I put it right on the corner of my desk. It reminded me that three weeks from then I was actually going to be going home. Now that was an encouragement in one way, but it also reminded me of the distance and sort of the pain of living apart from them. And the Holy Spirit's presence is like that. He lives within us, and he reminds us that there's this disparity and helps us to groan and long for that which we we are going to in the future. Looking forward to what's coming in the future can motivate you right now and help you so much. True biblical hope can make such a difference, and that is mediated to us by the Holy Spirit. All right, so we've got six things. Let's see if we can do six, and I'll give you the last one. It's easy. Somebody over here is worried we're going to have a quiz when we're done. Ready? Go. Walk in the Spirit. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Know the fatherhood of God by the Spirit. Hope in the Spirit. And your last one is pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. And verses, this is verses 26 
and 27. I think, honestly, I've spent more time in these verses, probably than any verses in the Bible in the last five or six years, it says this, and in the same way the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of, will of God. See, when I was in college, I struggled a lot with Jesus' wide open promises to answer prayer. I don't know if any of you have ever struggled with this. Things like, especially from John 14 and 15, and whatever you ask the Father in my name, I will do that for you. Things like, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Or, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will do for you. And I struggled with that because I didn't always see my prayers getting answered and Jesus gives you these wide open promises. What are you going to do with those? As years went by, I continued to look at Scripture and, um, and I realized that the, that, 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 that the issue in praying is especially being sensitive to the Holy Spirit so that you pray according to the will of God. 1 John 5 says, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have received the things which we have asked of him. Paul describes this in Ephesians 6 as praying in the Spirit. Book of Jude does the same thing, praying in the Spirit, he says. And this passage right here says, when we don't know literally when we don't know the what of what it's necessary for us to pray as we ought, then the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Basically what that means is this. It's not like, it's not like the Holy Spirit, it's not like you pray here in the dark, you have no idea what you're praying for, and then you hope that the Holy Spirit is over here and that he's going like, to fix up your prayers before the Father and make it good to him. It's not like that. This passage, actually right on the main verb, it has this prefix on it, this together prefix. So really this, and sometimes is translated, should be the Spirit joins to help us in our weakness. He is here with us as we pray and helps to guide us in our prayers so that our prayers are according to the will of God. So the basic idea, you know, there's a lot more to say about this, but the basic idea is that you become more in tune with the Holy Spirit so that when you pray, your prayers are according to the will of God, and that is done by the Spirit. So you want to be sensitive to the Spirit as you pray. It's, it's a shame that in our generation we don't talk that much about the role of the Holy Spirit in prayer, praying in the Spirit, praying according to the will of God. If you go off and you read the, the um, spiritual writers from the past, you'll find them saying this type of thing over and over again. I'm thinking of a passage right now from Augustine. I'm thinking of another passage right now from Charles Spurgeon, but this is the Tory conference, so I'm gonna read you a quote from R.A. Tory that hits this right on the nose. Here's what he says about praying in the Spirit and according to the will of God. R.A. Tory said, in addition to that, we must live so near to God, be so fully surrendered to the will of God, have such delight in God, and so feel our utter dependence upon the Spirit of God that the Holy Spirit himself can guide us in our prayers and indicate clearly to us what the will of God is. Isn't that great? I love that quote. Yes, we need to be so deeply dependent upon the Lord, mediated through his Holy Spirit, that when we pray, we are praying more and more according to the will of God, and to the degree that you pray according to the will of God, you will see your prayers answered, and you can be confident in that and pray in faith. So what are the seven uh, steps to living life in the Holy Spirit? Walk in the Spirit. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Know the fatherhood of God by the Spirit. Hope in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. All right. Now, part of this, part of this talk, um, you know, beforehand, I said that I would actually take some questions. So I actually want to take a few minutes for questions, maybe about six or seven minutes. So if you have a question, they're just going to put a mic up here. Just run down to the mic really quickly. Don't trip on anything as you come down the stairs, please. Go ahead and ask a question, and I'll try to answer it. 
to whatever degree I'm able to from the Word of God. Yes, any questions about living life in the Holy Spirit that I could help you with today? Just jump up and ask if you've got any questions. Just go ahead and jump up here. Thank you. Is there, is there ever a point in prayer that we can be certain that we are according, we're praying according to God's will? Yeah. Can, is there a point in our prayers where we can be certain that we are praying according to God's will? I actually think that there are some times when God does give us a real certainty that we are praying according to his will, but not always. See, God, God is, that's a great question, by the way. God is, um, let me use a theological term. God is a person. I don't mean that he is a human being, but he has personality and he, 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 he wills and he thinks and he, he even emotes. And so we, we don't put God in a box. We, God is not a jukebox. We pray and we put our, put our requests before, before him and God can choose to act in whatever way that he wants. And sometimes he will guide us in our prayers at that moment so that we know how to pray right in that moment. Sometimes it's a slower process where we come into a place where we become greater conviction that we are praying according to the will of God. Sometimes he moves us in a different direction so we stop praying in that direction and that's good. And sometimes, just because God can do this, he lets us wait because there's things he's trying to do in us. So all of those are possibility actually when we pray according to the will of God. Someone else? Jump up there. You start, so you start to just got to have to put to death and be led by the Spirit. So what should I do if I don't want to die? If you don't want to die? Yeah, I don't want to die. Yeah, okay. So let me just use it as a metaphor. Thanks. Uh, my bad, my bad, my Good. Bad. So here's the metaphor. Jesus says, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So yes, you have to be willing to die to yourself completely. You have to say, Jesus is my Lord. I'm willing to live entirely for him. But this metaphor here is actually about saying the sin that is in me, the temptation that is in me, we need to say no to that. Basically, this is just saying no to sin by the Spirit. Anyone else? I'm not going to carry this long too long. Okay, I'll take one more. Um, how do we get better um, at being led or, being, or listen better at, to the Holy Spirit? Yeah, that's a good question. And you're talking about the more direct sort of leading of the Spirit right here, not the general sort, which is, I would start with the general sort. I would say that you read the Bible all the time, saturate your mind in it, think about the Bible, be able to think it through the, through the whole storyline of the Bible, where it's going, what it's doing, what God's heart is, get to know God through the scriptures. That's the starting point. Next thing is that you become more sensitive to moments when the Holy Spirit has led you. Okay, so this, this is going to sound a little funny to everyone, but probably the easiest time for you to actually get a sense of when the Lord is, um, uh, is, is speaking to you through his Holy Spirit in the most direct way is when you're actually being tempted and you're starting to move towards sin. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit is like, stop! What are you doing? You guys don't know what I'm talking about, right? All right, now, use that as an analogy and start moving it into other areas because you've already probably experienced this at some point in your life. So then, at that particular point, and in any other types of areas, then the Holy Spirit um, can lead you. I don't have much more to say about that. Sheep come to know the shepherd. The longer that you follow the shepherd, you get to know the shepherd and you know his voice. Yes. Thank you so much for coming. Um, in let's, verse make, let's make this the last question, okay? Okay. Uh, in verse 14 it says, or I believe in verse 15 it says that we receive the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Yeah. What, is, what does that mean? Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's talking about being adopted and it's focusing, actually, I didn't talk at all about this, but it's focusing, focusing especially on inheritance rights. So in the ancient world, you get adopted, you get the full privileges of being a son, and then you can receive the, um, the inheritance that would be passed down. So you get to share then with Jesus in his inheritance because we are in Christ, we are connected with him. That's the direction that he's calling there. And then once you are related to God through Jesus Christ, then you have this access to him. That's what Paul says earlier in the book of Romans. You can actually go into God's presence 
you can be there knowing that he's your father in a way that other people don't. My, my daughters have access to me in a way that nobody else does. You know, they can come and come to me in certain places and at, at times that none of the rest of you can. And we have that same access with God because of Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit. Thanks for your question. All right, just so we don't forget what we've done, I'd like you to, at the end of this session together, I'd like you to stand up and let's go through the seven points so you don't forget them. Are you ready? Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Walk in the Spirit. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Know the fatherhood of God by the Spirit. Hope in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Now one more time, really loud. Walk in the Spirit. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Know the fatherhood of God by the Spirit. Hope in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. All right. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything, from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.